suffering on this trip. We're glad that they're home, and uh, we'll hear from them on Sunday. Um, I do want to make an announcement. If I could get some help, if I could have some ushers or somebody help me. Brother McConnell, can you help me? Brother Ken? I want to tell you about something that we're getting ready to start. And uh, how many of you know there's, if you don't take risks, sometimes there's no reward, right? So I'm going to be honest with you. We don't really know how this is going to turn out. We don't know what to expect. But uh, a few months ago, Tim Roth came to me with, with, with an idea that he'd talked to Brother Jordan for a long time and putting all these details together with a burden to be engaged and be involved in Matthew 25 ministry. Now, don't you think it's important enough if, if, if God was going to tell us what it takes to go to heaven or what's going to send us to hell, don't you think that's pretty important? And so if Jesus tells us the, the differentiating factor, obviously we know you can't be a part of the kingdom of God unless you're born again, but there are obviously other things that will be deciding factors in your involvement, whether you're going to go to heaven or whether you're going to go to hell. Clearly by Matthew 25, Jesus is teaching that there are some other things, and here's what he said. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats because you fed the hungry, you clothed the naked, right, and you visited those that were in prison. And they said, Lord, when have we done these things? And they said, when you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. And so this is a Matthew 25 ministry that we want to be involved in and uh, simply called Second Helpings. And this was an idea Brother Roth had. And basically, here's what we're going to do. We're going to attempt to just feed the hungry. We don't know. There may be five people show up. There may be 105 people show up. We don't have any idea. We don't have any clue. So what we're going to do is one Saturday a month for the next few months to the end of the year, we're just going to make ourselves available to various organizations. First of all, we've already partnered with Cherry Street Mission, and they're going to make this information known. They're going to pass it out. We're going to pass out flyers. We're going to provide transportation from Cherry Street Mission here uh, to, to that free meal on Saturday. We are also making this information available to several senior citizen homes and different places. I think Brother Sister Farnsworth are helping us with that. I think Tim is either he's going to talk to you or is going to make that happen. But several uh, senior citizen homes to, again, make this available to them. And so we're just going to feed them. And we've already got, we've, we've worked with uh, Sean Gross and some others to help with some donations. So we're keeping this at a very low, thank you, Brother Gross, appreciate that, a very low cost to the church, not going to be a uh, big output from the church standpoint, but we're, we're here to serve, ladies and gentlemen. That's why we're here, and we want to show them the love of God. And here's the cool thing. We're going we're gonna to feed them naturally. This is a Bible concept. We're going to feed them naturally, but we're also going to give them a second helping, and that is they're going to get fed the Word of God. And so we're not just going to come and feed them spaghetti dinner. When they get done with that spaghetti dinner, they're going to hear preaching. They're going to hear the truth of God, and then we're going to have a time where they just have some fellowship and um, I, I'm very excited about this. If you are interested in being involved in that, we don't, there's not a lot of uh, need necessarily, but if you're interested in being involved, we do need van drivers, we need cleanup, we need some setup, all these different things. Uh, Charlie Morin and his family are doing a great job helping us get the menu and the food and all that set up. Uh, so if you're interested or would like to be a part of that, maybe just come on Saturday. We need people to come and just be there uh, to help us during that time and to connect with these folks. Listen, we're not doing this. We do this because we want to show them the love of Jesus Christ. Amen? We want to, we want to demonstrate the love of God in a real, uh, tangible way to them that we're doing this for no other reason but to demonstrate the love of God. So if you're interested in being a part of that, wanting to help in any way, shape, or form, either see Tim Roth or myself, our first one is Saturday, June 16th, coming up in just a couple of weeks. And I'll be over in the Family Life Center. And then the rest of the dates are listed there. August, we have a couple of schedule conflicts. We're trying to keep it the third Saturday of every month. But we have a couple months where we have some schedule conflicts. Um, so mark those dates down. And again, if you can be a, maybe not all of them, but if you can come to some of them and come and be a part, we would definitely appreciate all of your help. And uh, if you have any questions regarding second helpings at all, feel free to let me know. I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry, the 15th. My bad. 
What's that? Yeah, that's my fault. See, that's what happens when you got 475 things going on. You just type it in wrong. That's Father's Day. That's right. That's right. We're not going to do it on Father's Day. But we are going to do it on that Saturday. So that would be the 15th. Is that right? The 15th. Okay. All right. So, yes, thank you for pointing that out. It is, it is Saturday, the 15th. Um, so change that on your sheet there. And uh, I think the rest of those dates are correct. So anyway, second helping is very excited about that. And uh, hopefully the church is excited because this is just an extension of ministry. Also, I do want to make a schedule uh, note, schedule change note. Uh, July 3rd, there are a lot of festivities going on in the neighborhood. Sylvania has a lot of their July 4th festivities taking place on the 3rd. And so as to avoid conflict and all that kind of stuff, we're actually going to have Bible study on July 2nd. Okay? So mark your calendar. We're going to have Bible study on Tuesday, July 2nd so that we're not interfering with uh, or competing with all of those other things. So July 2nd, there'll be a schedule change. Amen. All right, you ready for the word? We're going to get you out of here very, uh, we're going to get you out of here quickly tonight. We're not going to spend a lot of time. If you could put up the slide for uh, the Radical Church slide, if you could put that up for us. Tonight, we're going to launch, we're going to kick off our summer series called Radical Church, an in-depth look at the book of Acts. And the genesis of this, uh, this, this series, uh, I was teaching Purpose Institute, and my, my subject that I was teaching was called Apostolic Methods. And in one of the classes, I, I believe it was the second class, began to teach about various methods of the apostolic church. And I started going through, in that class, started going through Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, just started going chapter by chapter by chapter. And I started looking and thinking, boy, sometimes I'm not sure how much we look like the book of Acts church. In some ways we do, but there's a lot of ways I think that we need. And so the only way to model ourselves really after the book of Acts is to go back and study it in depth and look at it. How many of you want to be a book of Acts church? Amen. I want to fully be a book of Acts church. And so for the next several weeks... Uh, for June and July, we're going to just begin um, diving into, in a very in-depth way, diving into the book of Acts. Tonight, we're going to kick it off. We're going to launch it. And kind of the irony of this is that it's an in-depth look at the book of Acts. But tonight, we're not even going to touch the book of Acts. Because we're going to set the stage uh, for what we're talking about. So tonight, I want to talk to us about the church. Understanding the church and what that means. Uh, during Jesus' earthly ministry, there, of course, was constant debate and discussion about his identity. People wanted to, wanted to find out, was he a teacher? Was he a prophet? Was he what he claimed to be? Which, of course, we know he claimed to be God manifest in the flesh. As Andy Stanley states in his book, Deep and Wide, whether it was Nicodemus or the woman at the well, the question was the same. Who is this guy and why won't he come right out and tell us? So eventually, Jesus decides to deal with this issue head on. He takes his disciples to the majestic city of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi. And he takes them up to Mount Hermon with Caesarea Philippi just off in the distance. A city where Herod had erected a magnificent temple of white stone in honor of their emperor god, Augustus. And so with, with Caesarea looming behind him and the 1100 foot uh, foot up the slope of Mount Hermon, Jesus asks this question, who do you say, who do men say that I am? Who do people say that I am? Of course, we know the disciples answered. They said, well, what we're hearing on the streets, what pe some people are saying is that maybe you're John the Baptist and you've come back for vengeance or maybe you're Elijah. And Jesus goes directly to the heart of the matter and he asks the question that I believe is still being asked in our world today. And that question is, who do you say that I am? Because the reality is it doesn't really matter what others are saying. It really doesn't matter what others think. The, the, the focus, the whole point is, who do you say that Jesus is? And of course, we celebrate Peter's correct response when he identifies Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And, and in this tit-for-tat, conversation between Jesus and Peter, Jesus responds. 
with the verse that will be the launching point for our summer series, Radical Church, when he says this, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. Anybody thankful for the revelation of the identity of Jesus Christ? I am not ashamed to be a one God, apostolic child of God. Amen? I'm glad I've got a revelation of the power of the name of Jesus. I was teaching a Bible study today and I was teaching about the life of Jesus. And in, in the course of that discussion, I began to talk about the power of the name. Again, hell is very smart. He knows what he's doing. He knows that if he can fight truth, that, that, that he can get people to start to doubt the truth because he, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. He also understands that there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He, he knows that God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at that name every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. So doesn't it make sense? Hell knows what to attack, the foundation to attack. And that's why there's all this confusion and debate about the name of Jesus and what we're supposed to say over baptism and all that. But I'm glad to be a part of a church that has the revelation and the understanding that he is God manifest in the flesh. And we know his name. Amen. And we know that through his name, cancers are healed and sicknesses are healed and people are delivered and people are set free, not by anything else, but by the power of his name. Amen. Anybody glad for the name? Praise God. He said, for flesh and blood is not revealed to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I also say unto you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Everybody say, my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Allow me to pause and to interject at this point and remind us again that 2,000 years ago Jesus prophesied that there would be a church. That there would be a body of believers that would be built by him and for him. And that we would be an unstoppable force in our world. Ladies and gentlemen, hell has done and is doing everything it can to stamp out the church. But despite what you read in the magazines and despite what the secularists say, can I tell you the church is as strong today as it's ever been. As a matter of fact, in this world of, of humanism and, and this world of complete darkness, I'm glad to be a part of a church that is still triumphant. A church that's still on the move. A church that still believes. Come on, somebody. I'm glad to be a part of the apostolic church. I'm glad to be a part of a church that Jesus built. Not a part of a church that's built by man's hands. But I'm glad to be a part of a church that's built by Jesus Christ himself. His body. Because the gates of hell cannot prevail against that church. I want to put hell on notice one more time. That this church is triumphant. This body of believers is triumphant. We're part of a greater cause, a greater church. Come on, it's not just about what's going on right here. But around the world, God is pouring out His Spirit. God is doing amazing things uh, through and by His church. Come on, we gotta have, we gotta have, we gotta have some renewed faith in this thing. Because sometimes you, you read the newspapers and you read the reports and you think, man, this, you know, the church is in trouble and, and this, you know, we're, we're, we're losing ground. And you read the statistics about the number of people going to church and yada, yada, yada. But I'm telling you, the church is triumphant. The church is, hell has done everything since Jesus was born. Hell has attempted to kill the body. But guess what? The body's still alive. Hello? The body is still alive and it's still well. And there needs to be faith in this church uh, that yes, we're going to face some trials and yes, we're going to face some disappointments and we're going to face some problems and some issues, uh, but we're going to come through it because we've already been through some floods. We've already been through some fire and we're still here. We're still in the truth. We're still in the faith of God. Amen. You know, when, when, when you're a part of something that is prophesied by Jesus Christ himself. The Bible says what, what God has opened, let no man, nobody can shut it. What God has shut, nobody can open it. And God has opened the door in this dispensation. Opened the door to the church. And there ain't no devil in hell 
don't you dare believe the lie that the greatest days of the church are behind her. Jesus, I think Jesus understood in his foresight. He understood the hour and the darkness that you and I would face. And I believe that's one of the reasons he gave us the principle. Why else would he give it to us? That he always saves the best for last. There's coming a rain where the former rain and the latter rain are going to come down together in the last days. Aren't you glad to be? Listen, some folks say, well, you know, I, mean, I, I really would have been, I'd love to have been alive when Jesus was here. And I would love been, no, 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 no. You're a part of the greatest hour because I believe this is the generation upon whom the ends of the world should come. Listen, this is the greatest hour of revival. This is the greatest season. Don't look at any. This is our time, ladies and gentlemen. This is our hour. So there needs to be an element of faith that gets a hold of us. In spite of the onslaught of hell. In spite of the attack of hell. Because you, as an individual, are a part of a greater body. You're a part of the greater body of Jesus Christ. Because of that, you, as an individual, and as a family, and as a home, you also are victorious. That's why it's vital and, and, and important that you maintain your connection to the church. Because what hell would love to do is he'd love to isolate you. He is a, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And what's the lion do? The lion tries to separate the weak from the rest of the, uh, the, the rest of the flock so that he can attack the weak. What hell will try to do is to isolate you and separate you and keep you from everybody else so he can pick you off. Listen, we got to have a made up mind. Listen, God birthed me into this church and ain't no devil in hell going to get me out of the church. So for the sake of this series, I want to begin by talking about the church, understanding the church. This verse that we just read here is the first time the term church shows up in our English New Testament. Jesus clearly states to us that he himself would build the church. I think this is an important concept that we understand tonight, that it is Jesus Christ that builds the church. I am uninterested in a church built on personality, built on man's wisdom. See, here's what, here's what the world is trying to do. They've done all the marketing studies, and so they try to make their churches seeker-friendly, and they try to make it conducive to what people are going to like. And what, Can I tell you, you know what people like? They like to come in and feel the power of the Holy Ghost. If they want a good show, they'll go to Vegas or they'll go somewhere else to get a good show. And they're not going to come to church to get a good show. Hello? They come in. They want to feel the real presence and the real power of the Holy Ghost. I want to be a part of a church where Jesus is building the church. Because if, if we're dependent on what we can build, we'll only get the things we can get. But if we'll depend on Jesus building the church, there's no telling what God would do. Listen, if I've got a choice between my bank account and Bill Gates' bank account, there is no question who I'm going for. Right? But too many times we settle for the carnal version of what God wants to do for us. And we try to do it by our own wisdom and by our own intellect. We need to stay in prayer. We need to stay in fasting. We need to stay in the Word of God and the influence of the Holy Ghost and let God build His church. Now, that doesn't mean that we should just neglect planning and organization and try to do things with excellence. We serve a God of excellence, so we're going to do everything we do. It should be done with excellence. But that's not where our focus is. That's not where our hope is in revival. We understand that he's the builder of the church. Amen? Jesus Christ is the builder of the church. He states that he would build it and that nothing would stop it. But he also states that he himself would be the chief cornerstone. In other words, the reference point for the rest of the entire structure of the church. I think this is an important point as we begin this series, that Jesus is the chief cornerstone. That is the stone by which all others in the building will be measured against to make sure that the church remains in balance. If we get our eyes off of the chief cornerstone, the building will start to get 
a, a, a little out of balance. It won't fit just right. If we get our, but if we'll measure everything based off the chief cornerstone, they used to take the granite or the stone or whatever, and they would chisel it out, and they would measure it to make sure that it was in perfect alignment with the chief cornerstone. Every stone of that building had to be measured against that thing. That is how, ladies and gentlemen, that we maintain the balance and the structure and the strength of the church is by measuring ourselves not against other churches, not against popular trends, not against conventional wisdom, but we measure ourselves against Jesus Christ, who is the chief cornerstone. And if it does not coincide with the cornerstone, it can't be a part of the church. But something else was communicated in this important message, uh, in the, this important message or passage of Scripture, rather, that the English translation of the Bible misses. Specifically, the meaning of the term translated as church. Everybody say church. So I'm, we're, we're, we're going to talk about some things, and hopefully tonight you won't misconstrue anything that I say. And hopefully we don't want to, uh, uh, I don't want in any way, shape, or form to uh, undermine our faith and trust in the Word of God. But sometimes it's important to understand cultural context to fully or correctly apply Scripture. And as we talk about this term church, I think hopefully something will have a paradigm shift in our mind and our thinking as it relates to church and, and, and how something seemingly benign sometimes will slip into the way we think and the way we see things culturally and it will affect our ability to be who God called us to be. Let me show you what I'm talking about. The Greek term translated as church in the New Testament we know is what? Ecclesia, right? It's ecclesia. But what you may not know is that ecclesia is not a religious term. An ecclesia was simply a gathering or an assembly of people called out for a specific purpose. An ecclesia could refer to a group of citizens called out for civic duty. Or it could refer to soldiers called out to gather for military purposes. Here's the thing. Ecclesia never referred to a specific place only a specific gathering. The disciples understood what Jesus was trying to convey and what he was saying because they had the cultural understanding and cultural background. The Septuagint describes ancient Israelites as an ecclesia. Even when they were scattered all over the world, it still referred to them as ecclesia. As part of their experience with God, they gathered together in synagogues to worship together, to build each other up, to grow in their knowledge and understanding. But they were still part of the ecclesia even when they were scattered. And so Jesus prophesies that he's going to build an ecclesia. Everybody say ecclesia. Or a gathering of people called out for a specific purpose. And the early church had a very clear understanding of this. But something that in many ways has caused us to, something has happened that has caused us to lose the pure meaning of the term church. Let me give you some historical background. A few hundred years after Jesus made this bold declaration, Constantine in 313 A.D., who was soon to be the emperor of Rome, legalized Christianity in the Roman Empire, declared himself to be a Christian. This was a huge development because generations of Romans had attempted to stamp out this religion centered around a Jewish carpenter. And now the emperor makes Christianity fashionable by becoming one. Prior to Constantine, Christian worship was an ecclesia. A group of people that would gather together in a specific place where they would eat. See, we come by it honestly. Right? We're going to be the book of Acts church. We got to eat. They would sing songs. They would receive scripture teaching. And they would experience the power of God. And historians will tell us on some occasions they would mark a martyr's death by sharing communion near his or her grave. But after Constantine's conversion, worship began to incorporate elements of imperial protocol, including incense, ornate clothing, processionals, and pageantry. Worship became formal and hierarchical, relegating worshipers to mere spectators. They began erecting buildings dedicated to worship on sites identified with a martyr's death. Can you stay with me for a moment? We're going somewhere. Is this okay? Within one decade, 
of Constantine's declaration, within one decade, one ten-year period, the powerful Book of Acts Ecclesia ceased to be a movement and it became a religion. It was no longer an expanding group of people sharing a unique identity and purpose. It had become a location. It had become a building. It had become a facility. Let me just pause here and let you know, though, in spite of this, that's generally speaking, but can I tell you, there has always been a group of apostolic believers around the world somewhere. But the Talmud's French did the study. There's all, there have always been oneness believers all out through history. Dark ages, doesn't matter. There have always been one God, apostolic believers all throughout this. But generally speaking, in the Christian world, it became focused and specific about a location, a facility. And the more ornate, the more uh, beautiful the, the facility became, the more popular it became. The Romans began referring to the place of worship as a basilica which is the Latin word for public building or official meeting place. And then there was the Germanic or Gothic influence, which began using what is now the modern word, kirka, which means house of the Lord, and was, was used to refer to a gathering place, a ritual gathering place, whether Christian or pagan. And so kirka became the term used most often to refer to the ecclesia of Jesus And that's where we get the term church. What's my point? Here's the deal. Whereas most of the New Testament is a word-for-word translation of the Greek text, this is not the case with the word ecclesia. Church is not a translation. It's a substitution. And the problem that it presents, if not correctly understood, is that the term kirka refers to a location, but ecclesia refers to a people. You can lock the doors on a kirka, But you cannot lock the doors on an ecclesia. What happened was that the church made a philosophical. I want you to hear me now. This is so important. That early church made a philosophical shift from being a grassroots movement of like-minded believers to a place where you go and a place where you perform religious ceremony. The church was always intended. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost tonight. Always intended to be a group of radical believers that didn't go to church, but they themselves were the church. The facility, the place where they met, was only a vehicle that gave them the opportunity to minister to more people in a more effective and efficient manner. Please understand what I'm saying tonight. I'm very thankful for the house of God to come and worship. I'm thankful for a tremendous place. We have been blessed by God with a beautiful facility that allows us to come together to lift up the name of Jesus and to celebrate what God has done in our lives and to have a powerful experience with God. And some have taken this idea and this concept as a license to go Lone Ranger and start all these independent groups with no ties or connections to a larger group of believers. Can I tell you that that spirit is equally as opposed to the original Book of Acts church as the one that tries to confine our religious experience to a specific single location. What what am I trying to say tonight? Here's what I'm trying to say. This is the point. This place... This facility, as awesome and as wonderful as it is, this is not the Ecclesia. As much as I love it, this place is not the Ecclesia. You want to know why? Because this building has never been called out of darkness into His marvelous light. This building has never had its sins washed away by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. This building has never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. This building has never been healed, never been delivered, never been set free, never been sanctified, never been anointed, never been blessed, never been miraculously touched by God or experienced the divine hand of God. But ladies and gentlemen, you and I have. We have experienced all of those things. And God has empowered us to be the radical Book of Acts church that will turn our world upside down. This place facilitates the vision 
that God has given us for this city. But ladies and gentlemen, it cannot totally define our experience with God. Or we will cease to be the radical church that God God has called us to be. Somewhere in our minds, we've got to have a philosophical transformation back to the original idea. Back to the original concept where we understand that we are the book of Acts church. That I am the ecclesia of God filled with His Spirit and empowered by God to change my world. That's why Paul writes and tells us, Know you not that your body has become the temple of the Holy Ghost. Literally translated what, what, what he was saying there was, Know you not that your body has become the holy of holies. Your body has become the dwelling place for the Shekinah of Jehovah. You and I have the indwelling of the King of kings and Lord of lords. And God has empowered us not just to come to a place and sit on a church pew, but to go into our world and to make a difference and to tell, tell somebody what God has done for us. Hmm. Something philosophical has to change where we understand that to truly be a book of Acts church, we as individuals, we as a group together, we have to take the ecclesia out of the kirka. We have to take the experience the purposeful mission and the purposeful gathering together. We've got to take what we experience and we've got to take it outside of a facility, outside of a place. Because where people are, that's what they, that's where they need to hear about the life changing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, can I tell you one of the biggest lies we've ever told? And, and, and I hope you don't misunderstand what I'm getting ready to say. But one of the biggest lies we've ever told is this. If we can just get people to come to church, boy, everything will be over. It'll be a done deal. And listen, I love church and I love what happens here. And I believe that if, that if we'll get them here, that they'll experience something that they can't experience anywhere else. But if that statement were true, we wouldn't have facilities big enough to seat the people that have come into the church. If all it took was to get them here, We wouldn't have the facilities to hold the crowds that would come every single weekend. The reality is that that's not true. That's not the way God intended it or designed it to be. The truth is the way God designed it is for us to take our ecclesia, our experience outside and tell somebody else out there so that they'll want to come in here and experience what we experience. Right? Take this out there to them. You know, the Bible says that Philip... Philip came to Jesus and, and he said, I gotta go tell, I gotta go tell Nathaniel. And so he went to tell Nathaniel and Philip said, Man, Nathaniel, you need to, you need to come see Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel looked at him and said, Can anything good come from Nazareth? I'm not, I'm not going to see that guy. I notice and understand if Jesus, the Nazareth, from Nazareth would have gone to Nathaniel himself, Nathaniel probably would have rejected him just based on his race, just based on where he was from. Ah, he's from Nazareth. I'm not going to accept that. But because Philip went to him and told him, listen, I know, I know it sounds crazy, but I'm going to tell you right now, this guy is the Messiah. And would you do me a favor and just come with me to experience Jesus for yourself? And when he got to Jesus, you don't have to worry about Jesus showing up. Jesus is going to be Jesus when we bring people to him. He's going to be Jesus so all we got to do is just get, get them to Him through our experience. Bring them to Jesus with us. Not just hoping that they show up. Bring them with us. And when He got to Jesus, Jesus said, Oh, there's Nathaniel, an Israelite, in whom there is no guile. And He said, Oh, this is the Messiah. And He said, Because, because I told you and, and saw you sitting under the juniper tree that, that now all of a sudden you're going to believe me. And He said, Listen, you're going to see greater things than this, boy. You better buckle up because you're getting ready to go on a ride that's going to absolutely blow your ever-living mind. Listen, what am I saying? My point is this. What we've got to do, ladies and gentlemen, is we've got to take our encounter and our experience with Jesus Christ and we've got to take it to people and let them know. I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds nutty. I know you may not understand this, but I'm going to tell you, if you'll just come and experience what I've experienced, you'll find that Jesus is better than anything I can testify about. He's big. Come on, first apostolic. 
We've got to have a transformation of our mind that says it's not just about getting people in the church. It's about going to where they are. It's about going to where they live and to tell them about what God has done in our lives. Amen? A transformational shift. We have to take our experiences into the highways and the byways and share our radical faith with those who have never experienced anything like this. Teaching a Bible study today to those guys and... and uh, one of them, one of them leaned forward and he said, I got a question. I said, okay, what is it? He said, how come, how come people don't believe this stuff? He said, man, it's so real. He said, it's so plain. It's so clear. How come people don't receive this? And everybody at the table, all the other guys turned and looked at him and like kind of cocked their head a little bit. And they're like, bro, up until two weeks ago, you said you never were going to go to church a day in your life. But you know what made the difference? Somebody said, I'm not going to keep my experience inside the kirka. I'm going to be the ecclesia in somebody's life. And I'm going to go to them and say, look, guys, I'm messed up. I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything. But I'm going to tell you, I have found something that's better than parties. It's better than drugs. It's better than anything. You just come and see for yourself. And now this other, this other guy is saying, I've been telling, he told me today, he said, I've been telling everybody I come in contact with about this place. He said, I don't know, I don't know everything, but all I know is there is something in that place that I've never experienced before. It happened because somebody got the ecclesia, they became the ecclesia outside the kirka. They became the church outside the church to somebody else. If we're going to be the radical church, I'm going to just tell you flat out right now. I believe that the thing that hinders us the most is that we relegate most of our experience with God in here. Do you know where most of the miracles of Jesus took place? Anybody? In the public, in the streets, public places, right? I'm, I'm going to tell you what I, what this is, this is just me. I don't have, I don't know that I have, I probably could come up with some Bible for this, but I don't know it's a hundred percent Bible, but I'm a firm believer that the reason we don't see more miracle signs and wonders is because we wait to pray here because we have been, we have been hoodwinked by cultural influence into thinking that it all has to happen here. And not understanding that we have been empowered by the Holy Ghost. The believers shall lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. I don't know how that makes you feel. That kind of makes me mad. That I've been influenced by cultural things. And by generations of cultural influence. That has relegated our religious spiritual experiences to a place. And not understood that the reason that the church grew and God added to the church daily was because they understood we are the ecclesia in our world. We can, that's why we can have church in a prison. That's why we can, we can sing the songs chained to a wall and begin to worship and praise God and we'll see the miraculous power of the Holy Ghost because my religious experience is not confined to a facility or to a place, but it's understanding that I am the church. I am the body of Christ. And so if we're going to be the radical church, if we're going to be the radical body of Christ, we have to have this, uh, this understanding. Now, let me issue a couple of warnings before we come to a close. Years ago, we, we, I think we unwittingly opened some Pandora boxes on some, on some things. And I think it's important to, to uh, understand how the enemy will sometimes work to deceive us. Right? Years ago, uh, the, the, the church model was, you know, you pretty much had like a one-man show. The pastor, he did everything, and, and he pretty much was a one-man show. And then we got the revelation, and we're saying, look, you know, we should be a body, body ministry. That's the way we were intended. We should be body ministry. And so we empowered people, and that, that was the right thing to do. We empowered people to be engaged in ministry. That's a good thing to do. But what we did not do is, I, I don't think that we trained people well enough to understand that when you do that, you expose people to some spirits that will try to attach itself onto you. 
And we have to be wise. Years ago, years ago, and some of you, some of you that have been around a lot longer than I have will remember this. I'll, I've only heard the stories. But how many of you ever heard of the Latter Rain Movement? Heard of the Latter Rain Movement? You know, years ago, Miracle Signs and Wonders, her brother Cisco talked about it the other day at our licensing seminar. And he was talking about him coming up in ministry and God began to deal with him about gifts of the Spirit and how he was being used. But because there, was a, there were a group of people that misused the gifts of the Spirit. They got off into some false doctrine, some poor theology. And so they misused gifts of the Spirit. And so rather than, rather than taking and saying, okay, that's a false use, let's bring it back to the center and let's use it correctly, there was a group that said, no, 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 no. We need to come all the way over here and let's not, let's stay totally and completely away from that stuff. And so there was this, this, this uh, focused effort to put down anything that began to operate in the gifts of the Spirit and shut it down for a very long time. And so people like Brother Cisco were shunned because he was used in, in gifts of the Spirit, and healings and miracles and prophecy and all these different things. And so there was this, and so it left kind of this lasting deal on us. And so what my point is this, is there will be some people that will misuse teaching like this to validate their rebellious independent spirit. But I'm not going to be intimidated by a few knuckleheads that will misuse sound theology and sound biblical teaching and say, well, we can't talk about that, so we've got to come all the way over here. It's like grace. We're scared to death to preach anything about grace because we think people are going to think we're selling out on the doctrine and whatever. We're scared to death because they have monopolized, to use a, to use a political term, they have triangulated the term grace, and so now we can't even hardly talk about grace without people thinking that you've left the faith. Listen, I'm sick and tired of letting hell monopolize and triangulate biblical principles. I'm not going to come all the way, swing the pigeon all the way on the other side. I'm going to come right back to truth. I'm gonna, we need to come right back to the chief cornerstone and measure it against his word. What does the word have to say? Let me caution you against a couple of things. Some will misuse this teaching to suggest that you can be an independent spirit that you don't need a church. This has become a very popular thing. You can kind of do your own thing. You can, but I, can I tell you, as you'll see in future lessons, this violates the book of Acts principles of being a, an apostolic church to being a real radical apostolic church. It violates those principles. As a matter of fact, you can't be a radical church unless you're connected with a larger vision and a larger group of believers. Amen? Number two, guard yourselves against the Korah spirit. Everybody say Korah. Just because we're used by God, just because God allows us to be involved in ministry, it does not mean that we can circumvent God-given, ordained leadership. We will see in this in these series in series of lessons the example of apostolic leadership and how it influenced the direction of of the church. If we're really going to be apostolic, we're going to have to understand apostolic leadership and the importance of knowing our place and knowing where we fit in the body of Christ. Number three, this is not a license to not come to church. There are some people say, oh man, you should have what Pastor Dillingham was talking about. This, this isn't the church, so I can just stay home and have church in my home. Now there may come a day there may come a day in America where you're going to be hard-pressed to maybe come through those doors. Unless you accept everything that the government's trying to shove down your throat. There may come a day where you show up and the doors are, have been locked. Is that okay? I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm just being real. And you say, well, that can't ever happen. Yeah, well, I never thought that the government could force the Boy Scouts of America to accept homosexuality and that happened. I never thought that the government could force the Catholic Church to not be able to decide who they were going to hire and who they were going to fire based on their biblical, what they consider their biblical teachings. And the government said, no, you can't, you can't run your ministry that way. So I'm just saying, there may come a day where the doors are locked. And there may come a day where we can't come together. 
But ladies and gentlemen, forsake not the assembling together of yourselves. Even more so as the day of the Lord approaches. There's this popular trend of less church. We don't need that much church. We don't need to come together. Listen, can I tell you, as this world grows darker and more sinful and more vile against the things of God, that's when we're going to need our brothers and our sisters. Don't We don't need to separate ourselves from each other. We need to come together and to build each other up. I'll just be playing with you tonight. we got too many folks sitting out of Wednesday night service. We don't need to be sitting out of Wednesday night service. Not because I'm such a great teacher or any of that kind of stuff, but because we need to be a part of the greater vision of what God is doing. Is that okay? So don't, don't, don't use this as a license. It violates the apostolic model and the biblical commandments to not come to church. Here's the bottom line, and I'm going to close. Let's all stand. God filled us with His Spirit. God filled us with His power. Acts chapter 1, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Not so you can come to church and feel the goosebumps. Not so you can just come to church and run around the aisles. And those things are all good. And those things are, are great. I love, I, I love all of those things. But he said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me. Well, how are you going to be a witness unless you take the ecclesia experience outside the church facility? God didn't fill you with the Holy Ghost for you just to sit there and hold it. He filled you with His power and with His Spirit so you can go into a world of darkness and be a city that's set on a hill that cannot be hid. A light that's not set under a bushel but is is showing light in this dark world. Come on, anybody ready to be a real radical book of Acts, apostolic church, taking this message? You want to know why? I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why I'm radical. I'll tell you why, Bishop. You want to know I'm radical? Because I believe this message. I believe this is the only thing that can save the drug addict and the alcoholic and the doctor and the lawyer and the school teacher and those that are in prison and, and anybody else. This is the only thing that can save them. And if I don't go, who will? If I don't go and tell them, if we don't go and minister to these people, who will? And so I'm just, going, I'm just going to tell you flat out. We may not do it this year, but we're going to have some experiences uh, maybe in the spring. I know, I know uh, that last year y'all did a, a tent revival, took the church outside the church. We're going to do that again. We've got a deal coming up. You're going to hear more about it on Sunday, coming up in July. We're going to do a great time. It's going to be an awesome thing. You're going to hear more about that coming up. But even more than that, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go into these neighborhoods. And there may be some of them where you might be a little scared. But you know what? We're going to go into these neighborhoods. And if just for a couple of hours that day, we're going to be a light into their dark world. And we're going to let them know, listen, we're not satisfied with coming together twice on Sunday and once on Wednesday. We're not going to be satisfied until every person in Toledo has an opportunity to hear this gospel message. You've heard my testimonies. Just outside of Pittsburgh, one of the roughest areas just outside of Pittsburgh. I mean, just full of crime and all kinds of stuff. Set up a little little uh, stage area and had all kinds of games and all this kind of stuff. They even sent a police officer down because they were scared what was going to happen to the apostolic church. Listen, can I just tell you, we don't have anything to be scared about. Hello? We're the book of Acts church. God's going to take care of us. Amen? So I got, we, got into that, we got into that little park in that little area, and it was rough. I'm going to tell you, it was rough. But I felt such a boldness of the Holy Ghost. I'm, something comes on me. When I get in those environments, those, something comes on me, a boldness of the Holy Ghost. Listen, when we have a bunch of people that need the Holy Ghost, would you, would you just not hold it against me if I offend you? <laughs> because I get so bold in those kinds of 
moments because I, there, there's a boldness that comes on us, an apostolic boldness that you have to have in those kinds of moments. And so sometimes I just tunnel vision. I don't see anything else but people that need the Holy Ghost. And man, I'm telling you, it was rough, the rough area. But I, I could feel the power of God, the, the, just, just the anointing of God's presence in that place. I got up on that platform. Jerry Condon, his group was singing. The Holy Ghost was moving. Man, I jumped up there and I started preaching about the power of God, the power of the Holy Ghost. I didn't even get to the part about receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, you could feel, you could feel the Shekinah of Jesus Christ just settle in on that place. I mean, just the anointing of God settle in. And before I could even tell anybody about speaking in tongues, receiving the Holy Ghost, all of a sudden, a girl in the front row, about 10 feet in front of me, she just goes, bam, face first right into the grass. I mean, just face first into the grass. I thought, man, that hurt. A couple, couple ladies went over there, and they, they, like, you know, shook her to make sure she's still alive. And they flipped her over. When they flipped her over, you know what? She was speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance to her. And by the time we left that place, over 30 people had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. 20, 20 to 25 people had been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We had miracles in that park. Listen, church, this thing works outside the walls of a facility. It works out there just as much as it works in here. We've just got to change our philosophical thinking that says we've got to get it in here. It's got to happen in here. Oh, no, it doesn't. Take it to Chick-fil-A. Take it to your job. Take it to your neighborhood because you are... The church. You are the radical church. You have been empowered. You say, well, it's not my personality. Well, that's okay because it is the Holy Ghost personality. And you've got the Holy Ghost living on the inside of you. And you've got the power and the ability to do it in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness and mercy. God, I pray that this spirit, God, this mindset, this attitude, this thought would just... Would, would transform us, God. I pray, Lord, that philosophically, that our intellectual understanding somehow would be altered and changed tonight. God, that we understand we're thankful for what you've given us. We're thankful for what happens inside the walls of this church. But we also understand that you have empowered us by your spirit to go into our world and to make a difference. You said we are in the world, but we are not of the world. God, I pray that you would empower every child of God that's in this place right now. God, don't let us fall to deception. Don't let us fall to these spirits that would try to pull us out of the church, but help us to lock ourselves into the body of Christ and understand that we work together as a cohesive unit, no schism in the body, working together to bring glory to you. God, let there be a supernatural anointing that would come upon us uh, unlike anything we've ever experienced before and God we would go into this world and declare boldly declare the things of God and the things that you have done in our lives uh, God I pray that we would see miracles signs and wonders uh, God I pray that we would see great testimonies uh, 